pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Graham. Now, a lot of you know Jeffrey as the immediate um, predecessor to me here at the aquarium, where he did an incredible job. Um, I think, in fact, it's my personal opinion that without him, I don't know that we would be here tonight. So um, we owe him an enormous debt of gratitude. Uh, and he was also chair of the aquarium advisory panel before that. So he's been involved with the aquarium for a long time. Uh, what some of you may not know is what a distinguished scientist he is. And I'd like to tell you just a little bit about his scientific background, though he said to me, just, just introduce me and tell them I'm here. But I want to do a bit more than that. <laughs> Um, he started his career actually as an aquarium biologist while he was an undergraduate studying zoology at UCSD. Sorry, you'll kill me. At San Diego State. Um, and he received his master's in biology from um, SDSU and his PhD in marine biology from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And after his graduate work, he served as a postdoctoral fellow and then a research biologist at the um, Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. And then, before he returned to SIO in 1979, he was professor of zoology at San Diego State University. And he's currently a research scientist in both the Center for Marine Biotechnology and Biomedicine and the Marine Biology Research Division. And in fact, he was director from 1991 to 1996 in that division. And he has authored or co-authored over 130 papers. And he's been the recipient of numerous awards and a lot of honors as well, including the Smithsonian Institution Research Award and the Guggenheim Fellowship. Jeff's research interests lie primarily in the area of comparative physiology of vertebrate respiration, the biology of fishes, physiological specializations of pelagic fishes and swimming energetics in fishes. And these research interests have taken him all over the world to places such as Panama, Colombia, Costa Rica, India, and Australia. And tonight he's going to be talking to us about his research into air breathing fishes. And his title is called The First Gasp of Air, the incredible story of air breathing fish. Jeff, thank, thank you. you. Well, thanks very much for the very, very elegant introduction, Nigella. I hope that doesn't count against my time. I'm going to start the, <laughs> start the countdown now. Can you hear me OK? So it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to have uh, some of my family here. There's four generations of Grahams here tonight, my parents, my grandchildren, and Rosemary, of course, and my daughter-in-law. My daughter-in-law, Nancy, and uh, my wife, Rosemary, grandchildren parents are here. So it's a pleasure to have all my, sorry the front row is taken, and, uh, but uh, anyway we have, uh, it's good to have everyone here. I have put this date up here for tonight's lecture because 2004 is exactly, you can check me on this, it's 40 years ago this summer that I graduated from the University of San Diego State. There was no UCSD undergraduate program in the golden days. And uh, went to work at the Birch, or excuse me, at the Scripps Aquarium. And uh, there I uh, essentially started what's been a lifetime, lifelong fascination and devotion to this institution. Very, very fortunate. I think one of the things that I wanted to do when I started as the former director of the aquarium, when I started the series on, on the perspective series, was to allow the public to have an insight into what the scientists at Scripps do and how we feel about this place and how we do our science. And it's that little kernel of insight, I think, that's very important in creating for you the same kind of passion that we bring to our research and the kinds of things we study. So I, I'm aided tonight by, uh, by my students. Nick Wegner's here, Heather Lee. I'll talk in a few minutes about Heather Lee's research. Heather uh, will finish her PhD in my laboratory by the end of summer. And I'll be talking about her work tonight. So uh, stand by for that. Now, what I want to do is to take you through a series of things. Uh, this lecture is called Air Breathing Fishes. I wrote a book on that subject uh, some time ago. And uh, it uh, has been, Heather, there we go, good. I wanted to 
give you a sense of what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Because I'm going to do is I'm going to pose for you a biological question, a biological problem that existed at the beginning of the 19th century. To set the groundwork for that, I'm going to take you back to a time when there was a scientist named Linnaeus. Linnaeus is very instrumental in science because he was the first person to come up with and develop the binomial classification system. The binomial classification system that you all are familiar with, genus and species of organisms, is a common international language that goes around the world. I can talk to a zoologist in Japan, and we can talk about animals that we both know by virtue of their names. So Linnaeus' influence when he wrote Systema Naturae in 1735 was very important. At the same time, at the time that Linnaeus was doing his work, and in that period of time leading up to the beginning of the 19th century, there were lots of very important discoveries that have to do with the other half of what I'll be talking about tonight. The thing I wanted to leave, make the point about Linnaeus was that Linnaeus set in place a classification system. A classification system that for a hundred years kept people very content with just going out and putting new names on things and consistently building. At his time, Linnaeus had, done, had classified about 4,000 animals, 4,000 animals and plants. A hundred years later, there were about 40,000 organisms identified by, by uh, genus and species. And the important thing about this classification system is it serves us well today. The problem was that Linnaeus looked at things as essentially the product of a creation, essentially a fixed point in time, and species did not change. So we put names on things, someday we'll have everything cataloged. Well, the next big change that came along had to do with how discoveries changed with respect to learning about the physical environment in which organisms lived. Part of the Linnaean classification system had been one of simply looking at where organisms live and what their structures were like. Now at the same time that the biologists were going ahead and doing this cataloging, another whole set of scientists was working on problems fundamental to the life process itself. So I've listed three names here. Robert Boyle, who is uh, famous for, of course, inventing the gas laws and describing things, particularly with respect to pressure effects on gas volumes, but more importantly, was involved with the effects of vacuum. Vacuum on mice which if you put a, mice in a, uh, put a mouse in a chamber and put a vacuum on it, you can suffocate it. If you put, same thing, a candle, light a candle, put a candle in a vacuum, you can extinguish that candle. Joseph Priestley came along and discovered oxygen. He didn't really call it that, he called it deflophagistated air. So the phlogiston theory was very important. And what we do now when we're getting ready to examine our graduate students is we go into the chalkboard and write phlogiston on the board and they all run out and read about it. But it's an old theory and it has to do essentially with the idea that there was some vital force in the air that organisms utilized. Now, uh, Priestley discovered oxygen. He discovered oxygen by baking elements and allowing the gas to be admitted and learning that, ga that mice could survive when in fact oxygen was, was uh, released from a chemical reaction. Lavoisier was the father of modern chemistry. Lavoisier studied things like the gas exchange of organisms. He was the first person to essentially name oxygen, is what he named it, named hydrogen. He did the first experiments by, with organisms in situations where a plant provided oxygen and an animal would consume that oxygen. Now, Lavoisier was a brilliant man. He was also a French tax collector, and I've put a little picture of the guillotine there to show that he did meet an untimely fate in his early 40s in 1794 on the guillotine because he was a tax collector. But I've put in here into this picture the, the, uh, the square of the illustration at the top is to show you what we now know about respiration. And none of these things were really understood very well. Linnaeus knew enough to be able to classify fish as fish because they didn't have a lung. And so then we have this big problem because in 1837, simultaneously in both Africa and South America, scientists discover two very strange fish, the lungfish. 
I've got the illustrations here. Top one is an African lungfish. The middle one is a South American lungfish. The bottom one is the Australian lungfish. It does not enter the picture for another 40, 50 years after the first two lungfish are descri described. I'll tell you some interesting things about those lungfish because we won't have time tonight to talk about them any further than I'm going to tell you now. I've got a picture on the upper right hand corner of the cocoon. The African lungfish can climb into a cocoon when the, when the water disappears and essentially live for seven years wrapped up in a mucus ball in the mud waiting for the rains to come back. Seven years. The South American lungfish, if you look at the back, the pelvic fins, the back little things look like furry things. You can see them there. I have a big blown up picture of those. That, uh, oh bless you, I thought there was something, okay. Now see there is red green colorblind. A lot of people can't see these. I can't see them. But anyway, I'll just point. One time I was giving a lecture to 400 students and I got all tied up in a, you know, running the slides and this. And I said, I can't see this. Where is it? The student says, it's on the wall over there. So anyway, <laughs> here is a, here's the pectri pelvic fin of the South American lungfish. And the male has this. The male guards the eggs in the nest. So the male goes to the surface, takes an air breath, it's got a lung, takes this air, circulates it through its circulation, diffuses it out through this gill and oxygenates the nest. We don't have time to talk about that tonight, nor do we have time to talk about many more details about these two lungfish, and we'll talk briefly about the Australian lungfish. But there you can see in the lower left the distributions of these three animals and we'll talk more about them. Actually, there's more than three. There are four species of African lungfish. African lungfish, look here in the front. I've got some props here helping me tonight. Here's a lungfish breathing. Scientists 180 years ago saw that for the first time and could not believe what was going on. These fish come to the surface and take an air breath. Now, the problem really began with this. Lungfish breathe air, but they also have gills. So since Linnaeus had classified fish as having gills, what do you do? Well, you start worrying. There's no way to understand it. The year is 1837. Papers are published in 1840, 1839 by scientists actually describing the details of these animals. And here's pictures of lungs. This is the lung on the left of Protopterus. You can see there, it looked much like a lizard, looked much like your lung actually. Here's the African, excuse me, South American lungfish on top and the African lungfish on the bottom, Protoptus neoceratodus. The really remarkable thing is that lungfish have a very different kind of circulation. This also got the interest of these frustrated biologists who were in 1840 were trying to figure out whether this was an amphibian or whether it was a fish. Now mind you, at the time Linnaeus had written his first binomial classification, he had not distinguished between reptiles and amphibians. He had simply limp, lumped them all as reptiles. So the early literature simply argues about whether or not a lungfish is a fish or a lungfish is a reptile. But we know now why that's the case. But look at this circulation. Here I've drawn the general circulation of a fish. It's a big circle. Heart through the gills to the body. S for systemic circulation back to the heart. Just a loop. The lungfish begins to present us with a very different set of systems. It actually subdivides the heart into left and right hearts, just like a mammal heart. And then there's a central circulation that goes around to the tissues and also a branch that goes to the lungs. I've got some details of this down here. You can see here's the heart flow through it, through the different gill arches. But notice here, gill arches two and three simply have no gills on them. They're simply shunts to allow that blood to go around. It goes through over here and goes into this thing, which is the pulmonary artery. So lungfish present us with, animal, with an animal that is very different from fish. The guys are now arguing, well, is it a reptile? It's got a lung. Is it an amphibian? They don't know about amphibians yet, not time. The conventional use of the gills, of course, is and even at the time of Linnaeus, which was 100 years prior to what we're talking about now. Scientists knew about lung, lungs, they knew about, they knew about gills, they knew what gills were, and they simply surmised that somehow 
not knowing the exchange processes at all or any of the details that you see here, which show, for example, the gill structure of a bass, and then the detail of this showing how the water would move this way and the blood would move this way, and there would be an exchange system that would allow for respiration. Here was a situation where these fish had somewhat reduced gills, but also had a lung. So, it's, so it left a lot of questions to be asked. How does one classify a lungfish? They seem to be intermediate, but again, at this time in science, there was not a concept of intermediate between one particular kind of organism and another. There was no idea that there could be gradual change. So here are these two papers I mentioned to you. A German, Bischoff, wrote about the lungfish as an amphibian. Owen, this is Sir Richard Owen, who would become the founder of the British Museum of Natural History. Lungfish is a fish. Well, that's the problem I'm going to present for you to you, and I'm going to try to answer it in the next few minutes. But before we answer that, let me take you on a little trip to sort of teach you how script scientists try to get inspiration. And I'm going to use three examples. First uh, is Dick Rosenblatt. Dick was a professor here. He's now a professor emeritus. He's my lifelong friend, and he's been my was my PhD advisor and uh, consummate teacher. And I use the example of him at this particular party taking a little bubble blower and showing me how air-breathing fish make bubbles and asking me then to uh, go out and see if I can discover something as interesting as that. So Dick Rosenblatt has been a lifetime influence on me and I met him 40 years ago this summer when I first showed up here and somehow got hired to work in the aquarium. All of you may have seen this. This is Dr. Seuss, the Lorax, uh, having children. I read this story to them and was impressed by from the rippleless pond came the comfortable sound of the humming fish humming while splashing around. Dr. Seuss's fish never put their heads underneath the water. They're air-breathing fish, just like the guys here on this table in front of me. But in a more serious vein, here is Pete Scholander. Scholander was the founder of the laboratory, bears his, na bears his name now, Scholander Hall. Uh, Pete, when I came to Scripps in 1964 as an aquarium guy, was having this brand new building built. Here's a guy who could get National Science Foundation money to build a building and build a ship. And uh, Pete had a fascination with mudskippers. So in the summer of uh, 67, 68 perhaps, they came back from a trip to the Great Barrier Reef with these wonderful pictures that are shown in his book. Uh, here's Pete using a piece of equipment that he actually built. It's a micro gas analyzer. It's a great thing about script scientists. When they want to measure something, they figure out how to build something that can measure what they want to do. And that's the really fun part about doing that. I'll show you some examples of that. Here's a picture of Walt Gary and Ted Hamill, both of whom former script scientists. Ted's now Professor Emeritus, digging for a mud skipper, coming up with one. And then here is the question. Here we have this emerging series of science questions about what is an air-breathing fish, what's the relationship of lungfish to other guys, and what I'm doing you now is telling you that one could find inspiration about the questions to ask as a scientist by taking and invoking models of animals like mudskippers because it turns out that when a mudskipper is up in the air he has a very high heart rate and when he goes down in his muddy burrow where the oxygen is not very high in his muddy water his heart rate drops down. Now Pete was at this time very much interested in what he called the master switch of life. That is what controlled, what regulated aerobic responses to sudden or short-term asphyxia. And one of these is a pronounced bradycardia, a slowing of the heart. And here's an example. And so I said to myself, gee, you know, Dick had taught me everybody knows about lungfish, and nothing to learn about lungfish. Uh, here's Pete, got the corner on these interesting mudskippers. Maybe there's nothing else to learn. Aha, but serendipity worked. I was in Panama doing my pre-doctoral research, the Smithsonian, and went out one day for lunch and sat on this rock on the beach or on the rocks over the waves and watched, sat there very quietly. And here was these two fish that came up and looked at me. And always take your camera. So I was sitting there and I suddenly, they really came up and just looked at me climb out of the water, sat there, water disappeared, and they were just watching me. 
So I took my pen knife and I scraped off a barnacle and I took the flesh out of the barnacle and I threw it. And you can see this guy here, he's got a mouthful of barnacle. So they were sitting there watching me. And so I caught some of these fish and started figuring out what they were. And it turns out it was a species called Minerpes macrocephalus, a rock skipper. No one had done any research on it. Here it was waiting for me. It also had these really strange eyes, these cornea, these flattened corneal eyes. And uh, I looked at those for about a month and a half and couldn't figure out what anything about them meant. Brought a few back to my mentor, Dr. Rosenblatt, showed them to him. He said, sit down, take a piece of paper and draw me this. And he explained to me how a flat cornea is really a way for seeing in air because of the change in refractive properties of air and water. We could talk more about that later. Anyway, it's that kind of support, it's that kind of intellectual vigor that marks a scientist at Scripps. And it's a pleasure to be part of that team. It's, it's really a good feeling to know that all your colleagues are so good. Well, I sort of proceeded to do some experiments that I could do at the laboratory where I was working, Smithsonian in Panama. And two of the questions I asked were, why do rock skippers come out of water? Well, we had a great experimental setup. We had this huge tank with these big jacks in it. And every time we threw something in there, the jacks ate it. So I figured out, well, I'll build this ramp in the corner of this big tank, and I'll lay down a couple of poor sacrificial mud skippers, or mud, uh, rock skippers, and they'll get consumed. And so I did this, and sure enough, what you see here is that here's the fish goes in. These guys see it, they come over, the fish, they get close, the fish comes out of the water. He's pretty clever. I thought that was pretty important and uh, proceeded then to do more of those kinds of experiments and actually describe that. But on a more quantitative level, I was interested in this question. Can an air-breathing fish breathe air? Can a fish that comes out of water really breathe air? And can you measure it? So I did a series of experiments where I took fish of known body weight and I compared their respiration rates in water and in air. And sure enough, a fish like Minerpes that comes out and sits on the beach has the same metabolic rate that it has when it's in the water. So this was reassuring that these fish weren't simply just taking refuge on the beach from predators, but were actually prepared energetically to, make, uh, to exploit that environment if a possibility existed. What I've done here is I've illustrated for you the occurrence of air breathing amongst the fishes. Again, air breathing fishes is the subject tonight, and what I wanted to cover here was the depth and the scope of these animals and their diversity. So this particular picture shows you, here's our lungfish way over here, Here's another whole group of fish going up this way, and I'm more or less tipping my hand with respect to what the, how this problem that I raised initially is going to be solved in the next few minutes by showing this particular thing, which is called a simplified family tree of the bony fishes. Because on this particular side, we have lobe fin fishes, the kind that are the ancestral groups leading to the primitive amphibians, and hence to the uh, tetrapods, all the animals that uh, uh, now inhabit the terrestrial environment, the vertebrates that is. And on this side, we have a history of the evolution of the fishes, starting from very primitive forms going to very derived ones. And what you can see now is that up through here, up to the very higher teleos, most of the fish in this building are the higher teleos, all of these fish have some air-breathing capability. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to survey some of these fish for you and tell you a little bit about them and give you some good stories. Okay, so here's the largest fish in the world, freshwater fish, Arapaima, lives in South America. It has this very exotic, specialized lung structure that runs down the entire length of its back. Comes to the surface, takes these massive air breaths, makes a canoe shape when it takes a breath. Inside of this thing, this organ is so big, the kidneys are actually inside of this. Now, you probably don't know this, but I'll remind you, Kidneys are an organ that are actually retroperitoneal. They're behind the peritoneal cavity, actually built into the body wall. This organ is so big, it actually encompasses them and brings them forward. Here's another example of a fish closely related, somewhat closely related to Arapaima. This is Pantadon, called the butterfly fish. Lives in, lives in Africa, Central Africa. And here's the same kind of design. You see this very elaborate structure for breathing air, a lung-like structure. Surrounded, surrounding the kidney, built in to take this. Now, Pantadon, the butterfly fish, just essentially lays at the surface. 
all the time, floating, essentially floating at the surface. And so what it's done is it's taken these air sacs and penetrated into all the dense must all the dense bone of its body to make that very light. So essentially just floats with a lung full of gas. This is called the notopterity, the leatherbacks. They occur in India and Africa. And what's special about them is they have this huge gas bladder that goes all the way down their body. We'll talk more about the structure of that in a moment. But the important thing for you to keep in mind is that this particular fish comes to the surface, takes an air breath, swallows this air, forces it into this organ, and then uses this organ for breathing, for floating, for having a buoyancy state in the ocean, but also for making sounds and receiving sounds. So here's a four function. What I've done on the left here is to remind you of something that the scientists have to think about when they start thinking about where in the world it is that these air-breathing fish live. And this is to show you of what the continents used to look like 200 million years ago. Here's a little bit more uh, this side of that particular time. The, uh, here's uh, the Atlantic Ocean just starting to form. And here's the continent of India. Back in here, India is connected to South Africa. So imagine the ancestral groups of both these kinds of fish living on both continents. One continent, however, decides to take a ride, and it takes this entire fauna with it. And so they end up in India and also in South Africa and Central Africa. So the leatherbacks have that same distribution. Here's a fish I actually discovered in Panama while out in the swamps. It's called Pia Busina feste. It's in, it's, a, it's in the family Lebiosinidae. So you take a little, you get a dead fish and you preserve it and then you cut a hole in it. And what you can see is here's this PN called the pneumatic duct swallows air, forces it through this tube, inflates this huge structure. You look at this structure and you cut that open and take a look at it. Here's an anterior part. Here's a part that looks just like a lung. Here's a posterior part back in here for flotation. Look at these two little eyelid-like things right up here in front, right there. These are the connections in all of these keras and fish between the gas bladder which is a sound receiver, and the bones that actually connect to the inner ear are called the Weberian ossicles. So here then is the three functions, buoyancy, respiration, and sound detection in Pia Busina. To make things even more interesting, one goes into South America. Here's another group of fish, the Erythrinidae, closely related. Here's Pia Busina I just showed you. And here then are the same exotic structures, same specialization of the respiratory gas bladder in these particular fish. This is the tarpon. The tarpon is a marine fish, lives in shallow water along the east coast of North America, Caribbean. It has a sister species having the same, about the same latitudinal distribution in the, in the uh, western Pacific, Indonesia, northern Australia. And these fish have a small air-breathing organ in their gas bladder, in this flotation device in their bodies. Now, young tarpon live in swamps. So when they go out in the ocean, it's not really clear they need air-breathing, but they still do it. In fact, they have a very pronounced breathing behavior. Tarpon, of course, get quite large, six, seven feet long. And they can do this behavior. They come to the surface and roll, and these big bubbles come out of their opercular chamber. OK, so here's an example of a family relic. This is hoplosternum. It uses its small intestine as an air-breathing organ. Now, if you think about it for a minute, you think where I'm going. Here I am at, uh, here I am at just starting at Scripps in the early 80s, and out comes this weekly science reader that my student, uh, my, my kids in junior high and high school bring home. Scripps scientist studies, there's not a, there's a less polite word than tooting, but you can imagine. If gas gets into the small intestine, it's only one place it's going to go out. And so this particular fish was called that, that particular word fish, and we studied it. And what we actually found out, and it became quite a, quite a fun study, was here you can see I've drawn, the, I've actually pointed with the arrow to the air breath ex exhaled by the vent. That's the, that's the polite way to say that. You can see little bubbles rising there. Fish comes up, takes a breath. As soon as it takes a breath, swallows the air, forces the old air out the rear end, and puts the new air down into the intestine. Well, it turns out we figured out a way we could actually measure 
whether this was a respiratory device or a buoyancy control device. And it turns out it's both. But the way we could do this is we took a scale, a Mettler balance, suspended this over an aquarium, and all of you ever look underneath these balances, they all have hooks where you can attach something underneath. So we attach underneath a small little pan and a little place where the fish could hide. So essentially what we could do, as you can see here in this graph, when this fish took, took an air breath in, its buoyancy would be high, and then over a period of time it would slowly de decrease in buoyancy, and then it would take another air breath. What we're actually showing here then was that this fish, when it takes the fresh air, is light, comes in, sits down, relaxes, begins to absorb the oxygen out of that air breath, and as he does this, the lung or the gas bladder or the gas structure deflates, and he gets heavier. Then when he gets heavy enough, he goes up and takes another air breath. So this was buoyancy in the tooting fish. And as I say, my kids were miserable when it turned out that the weekly science reader picked that story up. This is the armored catfish. Armored catfish uses his stomach as an air breathing organ. The interesting reason why this happens, there are about 350 species of armored catfish living in South America. All of them have very specialized organs for receiving sounds built into their brain. So when it comes time to invent a new air breathing organ, they choose the stomach. Stomach is used, here's a picture of the stomach inflated. Do the kinds of measurements we do in my lab. In this particular case, we convince the fish to hide under an inverted water-filled funnel. We'd put a big black flap around this so he was hiding from us. And he would come up, take an air breath, come back down, sit underneath there, and after a while, when that air breath got no good to him anymore, he'd burp it out. So we'd catch it, measure the volume, and measure the contents of the oxygen, the carbon dioxide in it. So we could do those kinds of measurements. And here's what you see, these kinds of regressions. Again, mass as a function of expelled volume. And what they essentially show you, if you look at the triangles, is that if you give these fish about two or three weeks of practice, they get much better at this. They, take, they stretch their stomachs and take bigger, bigger breaths. What the other thing we found that was quite interesting, we'd be out in the field and these fair breathing fish would be in these swamps, they'd be coming up and all of a sudden they'd be very quiet and then they'd come up and so here we started doing experiments where we could see that well, when fish were in the same tank all together they would come up in synchronous fashion. All sitting there together, sort of saying well, you know there are big birds at the top of this river, at the top of this pool waiting to jump us, who wants to be first? They all look around each other, and then one of them decides, okay, let's go, and they all go. So we get this episode of synchronous air breathing. So here's the grouped experiment showing this. Here's the isolated fish in each one in a different aquarium. Here they all are together. We could show this quite significantly, took it into the field, and could test this in the field uh, in the same way. Here's the walking catfish. Air breathing fish are pests. Air breathing fish are pests because people can go in and poison rivers and poison streams. Air breathing fish merely get up and walk on to the next body of water and continue life. They don't care because they breathe air. Most poisons are given to fish by means of their gills. So these guys can shut it off. Here's the walking catfish, Clarius, introduced into southern Florida because cute little albino catfish could be bought at the store this big. After a while, when it gets to be this big and it's eating everything in the tank and tearing up all the things, people flush them. They end up in the rivers, the lakes. Now they're endemic in, in, uh, all through South Carolina, Georgia, and, uh, and into uh, Florida. And uh, they have very strict sp stick spines. You can see one walking here. They actually do walk through the grass. The car runs over them. These spines are strong enough to actually puncture the tires and get a flat. Now they have this very exotic respiratory device called a respiratory tree. And this respiratory tree is a modification of the gills. It sticks up in the back of the gill cavity. They'll come to the surface and take an air breath, hold it on these structures, and then expel it. This is a picture that you, unless you've bought a copy of my book, you've never seen. What we are doing here is I'm on a bridge in Panama. I'm looking straight down the water surface. You can see now all of these little things. Imagine those are the foreheads of this fish. This is Dormitator latifrons, called the sleeper. The sleeper lives in backwater swamps. When it gets deoxygenated, it actually takes its 
buoyancy device inside of its body and inflates that to the point that it gets positively buoyant, sticks its head out of the water and begins then to breathe air by means of very enriched vascular structures in the, in the forehead. So here's an air-breathing fish that uses buoyancy in a very different way, a positive buoyancy. This is a little story about history and the history of discovery. You can see that on the left, this particular fish is being pointed to with, with rubber gloves. It's an electric eel from South America, Electrophorus electricus. The electric eel and that particular, those two fingers are essentially showing where from the brain to the, the uh, vent is, essentially that's the functional part of the body. The rest of that body is simply a big pack of modified muscle cells that turns into a very powerful battery and a shocking device. So this was discovered, uh, the uh, natives of South America knew about it for a long time. It was discovered as the uh, Spanish went in and started exploring. These animals breathe air, they have no gills, they have this cauliflower looking structure in their mouths. They come to the surface, take an air breath and hold it, and then proceed to shock anything that comes near them because they can eat whatever they shock, and that's the way this mechanism works. But let me tell you a little story about this. Here's some oceanography for you. Here's the Gulf Stream. The main shipping route from South America to, the, to North America and across to, across to Europe was by means of taking advantage of the Gulf Stream. And the Gulf Stream moves in such a way that specimens that were collected in the northern part of South America could be in fact transported into the, into the at that time, 13 colonies, and then across the North Atlantic to England, and ultimately to Europe, into, into the heart of Europe. And so the first observations we have by scientists interested in things that I'm interested in, like air breathing, are made by a professor, or Dr. Garden, who was actually living in Charleston, South Carolina, major shipping port. We follow the story forward, and we find out that this particular fish, the electric eel, which has this air breathing capability, and thus can be transported, throw it in a barrel, send it to, back to Mother England for them to look at, it arrived back in Mother England, and proceeded to initiate a series of very important experiments demonstrating, quantifying the presence of electric capacity in fish. Now, a scientist in actually living in South America had learned this, and they had learned what was going on, but it took the movement of these fish to Europe, where a fellow named John Walsh, he's actually probably the first guy to actually award a grant. John Walsh was a member of parliament, a member of the Royal Society. Uh, there was a very distinguished uh, scientist in England named John Hunter, and uh, John Walsh said to John Hunter, I want you to dissect this fish and tell me how its structure looks like. Hunter then gathered all of his people together, dissected this fish, came up with very exacting descriptions of these essentially plaques of muscle that were modified to produce essentially a battery. And this device actually uh, Walsh used in a couple of experiments to actually show that first of all, a bunch of people holding hands could get shocked, but more importantly, that they could actually generate electric arc. And this was the first thing that was actually ever done to show that this electric property in these fish, which had been known from the Greeks, it took, however, an air-breathing electric fish to get this, uh, get these animals in a place where they could be experimented on. Well, anyway, Count Volta, the discovery of the battery, the discoverer of the battery, the first guy to make a battery, learned from these models and developed the first battery. And you can see on the left here his his pile, electric battery consisted of thin plates of two different metals stacked with layers of brine-soaked pasteboard. It's exactly modeled after Hunter's dissection. So here's an example of how air-breathing fish science had contributed to, to the development of the electrostatic hypotheses and electrostatic theory and the development of all that science. These are the anabantoids. You've all seen these in aquaria. They have very specialized structures in their skulls called labyrinth organs. Here's the, here's the beta. These are uh, tinopoma. This is kissing garami. This is a garami here. Again, the same kind of distribution, Africa, uh, India, down into Southeast Asia. Here is one special example of this called the climbing perch, Anabus testudinus, famous because 
it's been seen in trees and it's called the climbing perch for that reason. Turns out that if you go back in the 1850s, the first British scientist working in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in India had discovered this fish and actually searched it out and found that it was actually living in palm fronds. And as the waters of the monsoon would come up, the water level would change, these fish would go higher in the tree. The water would go away and they'd be left in the tree. So it looked like they were climbing trees, but probably the case was this. Here's a pest. This is Chana, the snakehead. You find this on the internet, it's plaguing now the Potomac. It's, it's naturally pre-adapted to invading all of the southeastern U.S. Its distribution is, natural distribution is from northern Korea all the way down through and including uh, Vietnam. So here it is, ready, it's now been introduced. The Chinese like to bring it in, it's apparently good food for, good food for pregnant women to eat. And uh, there's a great story going back in the, in the 1850s about they used to keep these fish alive in carts and if you come out and buy a hunk of it they cut it off and the poor air breathing fish would continue to live they just uh, whack it and take some sections from it. Well I'm now going to start a transition into Heather's research and I want to show this picture of Hickson this is from 1889 naturalist in the North Celebes and Hickson's idea about these mudskippers and we've got a mudskipper on TV up here Heather's done her doctoral dissertation research on mudskippers. This is the fish. This is the fish that Scholander brought back that I first saw. And Hickson's idea was these fish essentially had to have their tail in the water at all times to breathe. Essentially, had transferred their gill function, their respiratory function, to their tails, and since they went around with their tails in the water all the time, that was his theory. Well, it turns out they don't have to do that, and they have some very exotic behaviors. And here is an example of uh, Heather's research we'll talk about now. First of all, we've got uh, fish that jump up like this. Uh, this is a scartolaus. It's one of the rock skippers. And uh, here's another feature of Heather's research, is the ability to actually find out what the mudskippers are doing in their burrows when they burrow down. This is the subfamily Oxydersini that includes these four genera on top, which are all mudskippers, highly amphibious fish, Related to them, the same subfamily are a series of other fish that have properties related to breathing air but not necessarily leaving the water. And so these are animals that we're interested in studying and Heather's been studying to try to figure out what it is that pushes these fish forward. So here then are some more examples of this, pictures of Heather's work showing uh, mudskippers in the field and uh, she has been characterizing structures like these exotic burrow designs they make Here's the behavior of Scartolaus going into its burrow. And here's the, we're going to start now over here. We'll look at this. Got to show a film here. Okay, so this then is Scartolaus. This is in Australia. Now watch this fish. He's going to open his mouth and take an air breath. See there? Down he goes. He's putting air into his burrow. Okay, so Heather built this device where she could actually come underneath and watch fish in an in a imaginary burrow. And you see them depositing the air there? You see that? So what these fish do during low tide is they come to the surface, they collect air, they go down and deposit it in their, in their burrows so that when the high tide comes and they have to live in this burrow, they essentially sit there and, uh, and can make use of this air when they are in fact locked into their burrows. High tide comes, this fish is going to be under seven or eight feet of water and so it can't simply come to the surface at that point but it has to lock in enough air supply for this particular uh, adventure to go on. So there we can see that again, air deposition behavior. Just let you see this one more time we'll go on. Open mouth now. There we go. Down he goes. Great. Okay so and then you can watch it come up. One, two, three, release. There we go. Okay, terrific. Okay. 
Well, what I want to do now is go back and just answer a few questions about, the, about what I've told you and try to put some, put some answers with this. First of all, the lungfish question, we can, it's easy to explain now based on continental drift how these animals ended up on these different places. Second, what I've shown you, here's an imaginary fish which I'll call for the purpose of this discussion, Aerospirichthys. Aerospirichthys is a fish that it takes in everything from intestinal to stomach to gill to lung or gas bladder breathers or mouth breathers. Here then is this, phy this phyletic or this phylogenetic relationship, this tree that I showed you earlier. And what I've done now is I've illustrated for you, and you may have detected this pattern as we went along. Here are lung fishes, here's all these guys down here that are using either a lung or a respiratory gas bladder. It's when we get up here to the higher groups, the rock skippers, the mud skippers, that are using their skin and their branchial, ca branchial chambers and other specialized devices for breathing air. In terms of the perspective that we can take on this kind of science based upon the work of Linnaeus, of course, with the ideas of Darwin coming along, we had the idea then that we could understand diversification and the linkages and the relationships of organisms. And so as quickly as soon after the discovery of these lungfish, the emerging theory was uh, expanded to include things like natural selection. So here's Charles Darwin. Here's Darwin's bull, uh, bulldog, which is Thomas Huxley. It was Huxley who began to piece together the relationship between the existing lungfish and the fossils, and essentially come up with hypotheses linking these to, to the modern uh, fishes and to the tetrapods. And here now is a current phylogeny. The current hypotheses about this are based upon the discovery in 1932 of a fossil tetrapod called Ichthyostega. Current hypotheses are that lungfish are, the, are close relative to the ancestral lobe fin, but are not the ancestor of the modern tetrapods. Most of the groups that I'm showing you in this region have all been discovered in the last 30 years. All of these groups down here. So the, so the fossil record is coming together. But again, the interest of the fossils will tell us one thing. What we really have to know beyond that is what the physical and causal factors were in the transition from these fish to air breathing and then to life on land. And that's what studied, that's what uh, has interested me all these years. A passion of mine has been to link air breathing and phylogenetic change. I also make a collection of these kinds of cartoons, and so I'll just show a few of them. Here's one where about a guy's learning to hold his breath. Probably not very funny. Here's, I like this one. Links between air breathing and terrestrial life. You can see the fish coming up there, and then uh, the environmentalist running off and trying to save it by pushing it back in the water. <laughs> like that one. This one, more links between air breathing and terrestrial life. Poor Dougie went out to get the, uh, the football, and he, of course, can't find his way back in. And so, no use. He's panicking. OK, so implications for human evolution. Evolutionary thoughts, let's go fishing. And the post-Enron view. <coughs> well, what I've tried to do tonight is to give you an insight into the kinds of research that we do in our laboratory. I've tried to feature the work that Heather does. She's here. She'll be glad to answer questions. We have a living lungfish up here for you to look at, living uh, mudskipper. The driving force for me, and what I feel an abiding interest in, is the passion of understanding both these kinds of diverse problems that transcend things like the Gulf Stream and global climate change and continental drift, but also extend back to the basic science of trying to get to know these fish a little bit better. So thank you all for your attention. I'll be glad to answer questions. The question really had to do with the, the bifurcation of the, of, the, of the phyletic tree, and I'll think I'll see if I can find that here. Well, this is fossil evidence suggests, and fossil evidence indicates, in fact, that there were, back in the Paleozoic, these two kinds of ancestral groups of fish, the ray fin fish and the sarcopterygii, the lobe fin fish. These are present in the fossils, okay? There's no doubt about that. Now, the major functional difference between them was fin structure. And, and some skeletal details, okay? And the lobe fins were initially the very dominant group. And 
slowly over time they were replaced by the actinopterygians, which had more flexible fins and probably could swim better and do more things effectively. Uh, if they took so, so much time getting air, how do they get time to eat or grow? <laughs> well, this is, this, is a, this is a good point. Uh, it's even more relevant for mammals, isn't it? The advantage of breathing air is there's about 40 times more oxygen per mouthful than there is in water. So one advantage is that in terms of the respiratory effectiveness, the, the amount of effort spent to breathe goes down. You have to factor in, of course, the need to climb to the surface and take a breath and come back down. Clearly, this is a shallow water phenomenon. In the case of air breathing specializations, though, what I've tried to make the point tonight is we've got lots of fish that live in water and many that actually invade the land, reinvade the land, much like the, we think the primitive tetrapods did back in the Paleozoic. And the question was, what's the relationship between swim bladders and lungs? And Darwin actually used, in his, uh, in his Origin of the Species, used the example of the gas bladder evolving into a lung. Now, most biologists now, current view is that the lung is the primitive structure. And the lung has derived into more exotic, specialized structures. And as this evolution has occurred, the respiratory function has gone away. Hence, you get to the most derived fishes and there's no more use of the gas bladder as a respiratory organ. The primitive ones have this buoyancy as well. Okay? But now, we don't really know the answer to that question fully because there are no fossil evidence of lungs. No fossil evidence. We can tell you, here's a group that has a very specialized pulmonary circulation. Here's a coelacanth. Again, a, a fairly, uh, you know, living in 100, 100 meters of water, marine fish derived from this group, a lobe fin fish, it has a pulmonary circulation. It does not have a functional lung. The lung is filled with fat, but it has a pulmonary circulation. So this is some suggestion that this lung is a primitive structure. <laughs>